in order to solve this great problem that we have, um, climate change, in order to reduce our emissions, we, we essentially we have to rewrite the essay that is humanity, um, our economic and cultural system. We have to rewrite it. And so many of us are caught in two s sorts of traps about that, uh, about that editing effort that we're collectively undertaking. First, a lot, uh, I think most of us still believe, um, I'm talking about the public at large, that, it, that we can solve this problem by, by dotting I's or crossing T's. And in fact, we're going to have to insert new sentences and rewrite paragraphs. Half of the Boston Society for Architecture, I want to welcome you all to Electric Futures. I'm Jenny Efren, and we're very excited to bring you this forum along with our partners, the Green Ribbon Commission and the Mass Climate Action Network. We're all here today because we know that there's no time to waste in reducing our carbon impact and that we as architects, engineers, builders, policymakers can make a huge difference. For me, as the policy director for the BSA, I'm excited to hear how this bold regulation passed in a town meeting and also how this regulation can actually work with sustainable methods that are already being built by our colleagues today. We have a powerhouse group of, pre of presenters, but before I pass the microphone along, I wanna give a special thank you to BSA board member, architect and advocate Ellen Watts, who is joining us remotely today. And she has worked really hard to organize this event along with Lisa Cunningham, who you will hear from shortly. So we're really excited Hope you all enjoy this. We will have a break at about 10.30, um, and we will have a time for Q&A as well. So now I would like to introduce Amy Longsworth, director of the Green Ribbon Commission and friend to the BSA. The Green Ribbon Commission is supporting the way for Boston to become a carbon-free city by 2050. Uh, the Green Ribbon Commission is uh, a group of 35 CEO volunteers, uh, co-chaired by the mayor and uh, Amos Hostetter, the one of the founding board members of the uh, Bar Foundation, and our mission is to convene sectors across the city of Boston to support the city in the implementation of its Climate Action Plan, which as you know, was updated in October of 2019 and set a goal of uh, zero net carbon by 2050. So I'm here this morning and I wanna thank the BSA and thank MCAN and thank all of you for coming. I'm here today to try to exhort you to bear strongly in mind the challenges that Boston faces versus which is of a slightly different flavor than Massachusetts as a whole. We need to focus on existing buildings. 85% of the buildings that will be here in 2050 are here now. Uh, and large commercial space is, uh, is the cause of, of the majority of our carbon emissions. I'm talking lab space, office space, um, hospitals, all kinds of commercial space, as well as large multifamily. So the challenge here isn't how to do a house. The challenge here is how can we bring the right technology so that we can deeply retrofit, electrify those large, and electrify those large buildings. Um, I have some statistics that I'll skip over because I will just show you this is our carbon free Boston report I'm sure most of you are familiar with it it came out in January of 2019 underneath this are four technical reports available on the BU website the Institute for Sustainable Energy at Boston University they are a fantastic resource they take a deep dive into the building stock the energy supply um, waste and our transportation systems and they take a look and they are full of underlying data sets and even if you want to go even deeper than that the folks at the Institute for Sustainable Energy are happy to talk to you and I, I know many of you were involved in those working groups um, so I would say you know my sort of request of you today is to keep in mind the challenge of the large commercial existing building space because we have willing building owners but they can't solve it. They can't figure out how to do it and they can't figure out how to make it pencil. So thank you so much for your help. Bring technology examples forward. Identify buildings and building owners that are willing to work with us and with you as you know, transparent pilot test cases so that the city can prove where it needs to go is a good place to go. And that brings me to my last two points, which is the city of Boston is working on policies, one to set a zero net carbon emission standard for new buildings, 
and the other is to establish a building energy performance standard that will act, you know, vaguely like a like a Reggie. It will be it will ratchet down over time, and building owners will be required to meet it. Probably start with bigger buildings and then move towards smaller buildings. So those discussions of how to formulate that policy. Those discussions are ongoing at the city, led by Alison Brizius, who was here last week co-presenting with me, and uh, really, really, really need your expertise and your input on, on those discussions. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop. Uh, thank you again. And I would uh, next up is Tommy Vitolo, who I'm sure many of you know, I just met this morning, a Mass State Rep from Brookline, energy industry expert and leader in the, our climate change efforts. So Tommy. I'm still a state representative from Brookline, at least until November. We'll see. Uh, and in that role, I serve as a Brookline meeting member at large. I've also spent 10 years working in the energy industry as a consultant, uh, focused on accelerating the phase out of expensive fossil fuel power plants and replacing them with things like solar, energy efficiency, and more recently, storage. And so because of state policies like our annual increase in the renewable portfolio standard and offshore wind generator construction through 83C and 83D, and because of Brookline's local community choice program, uh, where's, where's Carol? Carol, raise your hand. There she is. Carol and I worked on that. We're going to switch mics. Uh, because of all of these, reasons our electric grid continues to get cleaner. The New England electric grid is primarily methane-fired combined cycle generation uh, with a healthy dose of wind and solar and nuclear and hydro, all of which are non-emitting. And as a result, electric vehicles in New England are cleaner than diesel or gasoline-fired, and electric heat pumps emit less carbon than natural gas or oil. Because electric is less emitting, we reduce emissions every time we convert. Things like propelling a vehicle, heating air, or heating water to electric. This, in fact, has a name, beneficial electrification, and you'll hear it from time to time. It's a good public policy, right? It's a policy that, over time, reduces our emissions. And because the electric grid gets cleaner each and every year, that benefit continues to grow over time. And so the calculation for how much better it is today, in fact, it's even better next year and the year after and so forth. <clears throat> and so if we are to reach our climate goals, we must reduce emissions caused by heating buildings with oil and gas. And I'll say that again for the folks in the back. And also for organizations like the so-called Massachusetts Sustainable Energy Coalition, funded by National Grid Eversource and the developer of the Weymouth Compressor Station. If we are to meet our 80% by 2050 target from the Global Warming Solutions Act, or um, now in vogue thanks to the governor uh, and the legislature, a 100% net zero by 2050, um, we must, must go after the heating sector. We cannot do it on electricity and EVs alone. We've got to get after our buildings. This body clearly understands this phenomenon, and um, that's why you're here, right? And so the question becomes, how are we going to make this transition in our building sector, a sector where the infrastructure is installed for 20, 30, 40, even 50 years without replacement, and we don't have 50 years to replace them all? Right? The most efficient, the least cost per carbon ton avoided, and the most economic way to reduce emissions from the building sector is in new construction and major renovation. When you're in a hole, the first thing to do is stop digging. We must reduce our emissions from our heating sector. Warren Article 21, as passed by the Brookline Town Meeting, simply takes away the shovel. I also want to just mention briefly, um, brag a little maybe, uh, I've got a bill kicking around the legislature. Uh, you may have heard that the Senate 
not the House, but the Senate just passed an omnibus climate bill. They included in that language from a bill that I drafted specifically relating to labor. Um, if we're going to transition from installing gas boilers and even, dare I say, oil to heat pumps, we need to make sure that architects, engineers, and builders all know how to do it, right? We want to make sure it's done right. And so uh, a bill, a portion of a bill I drafted that has now been included in the Senate omnibus bill uh, provides money for that training. And I think that's really important if we're going to have a just transition. Uh, we've got to make sure that the folks who do the jobs uh, are able to continue working in this space, continue feeding their families, and continue, uh, frankly, building great buildings. And so now I'm going to introduce the next speaker, but I have it written down somewhere else, um, Michael Grant. He's here, yeah? There he is. Michael Grant is co-chair of the Boston Society of Architects Committee on the Environment, where he and fellow co-chair Alejandra Menchacha have introduced new cutting-edge sustainable design programming available each month to the BSA's members. Michael is a practicing architect and educator, specializing in high-performance building design and sustainable master planning, and, and is an associate with Stantec Architecture here in Boston. Michael. Hey, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our first uh, two speakers. Jesse Gray and Lisa Cunningham are both co-petitioners of Brookline's new bylaw which is the prohibition on new fossil fuel infrastructure in major construction. They're climate activists who believe that individuals working together as a team, as was so crucial in Brookline, can step up and institute uh, real transformative change in their communities. By profession, Jesse is a PhD geneticist, and Lisa is one of the three architects who were part of the co-petitioner team. They're both elected town meeting members in Brookline. So please uh, join me in welcoming Jesse Gray and Lisa Cunningham. I think many people in the audience know this information in great detail and depth. Other people are here to learn about it and know less about it. So I'd like to start with kind of an, an overview and start by asking, what is this new bylaw and why is it such a big deal? Maybe, maybe start with why is this new bylaw that Brookline has passed such a big deal? Thank you, Michael. It is fantastic to be here. Thank you to the BSA for hosting uh, the Green Ribbon Commission, MCAN, everybody who's helped out. Um, it's really fantastic to be here. <coughs> I think that the reason that this bylaw I is a big deal is that um, in order to solve this great problem that we have, um, climate change in order to reduce our emissions. We, we essentially, we have to rewrite the essay that is humanity, um, our economic and cultural system. We have to rewrite it. And so many of us are caught in two s sorts of traps about that, uh, about that editing effort that we're collectively undertaking. First, a lot, uh, I think most of us still believe, um, I'm talking about the public at large, that, it, that we can solve this problem by, by dotting I's or crossing T's. And in fact, we're going to have to insert new sentences and rewrite paragraphs. Um, there's another group of us that are caught in the, in the trap that um, this rewriting effort is just simply too hard and um, that we don't know what, what the steps are that will, that will actually get the job done. So this bylaw is a big deal because it, it, it's the first sentence of a paragraph that um, reduces our building emissions to zero. Um, we can't do that without electrifying buildings. And the first step, as Tommy mentioned, it, when you're in a hole, is to stop digging. So this bylaw is a big deal because it starts with the easiest part of a really difficult problem. And um, the easiest part is when you build a new building, not to install new fossil fuel infrastructure in that building. Mm -hmm. I can just add that um, we can't wait for the, we obviously can't wait for the federal government to act, and we can't wait for the state government to act. So that's why it's very important that towns and cities step up, step up and start to do this work as we've done in Brooklyn. That's great. Thank you. So again, kind of on the overview uh, part of the talk, um, what is this bylaw about? How can you briefly describe what, what the bylaw does and what the provisions of the bylaw are? So th this bylaw affects uh, the construction of new buildings and 
and major renovations of existing buildings. So those are the triggers for the bylaw. And when the bylaw is triggered, it prevents the installation of, of new fuel piping. So piping that would otherwise potentially be used to deliver natural gas to a boiler or a furnace or a hot water heater. Um, this bylaw is a prohibition on the installation of that kind of, of piping. And um, along the way, there was a political process where, um, and, a, and a technical process where uh, we thought through, you know, which of the parts of building electrification as it, as it applies to major renovations and, and new construction are tricky. And so there's some exemptions uh, built in. So there is still some fuel piping allowed um, at this stage to, to um, ease our transition into all electric buildings. But the, the major sources of emission are the, the space heating and the hot water heating. And, um, and so that's, that'll be the biggest impact of this bylaw. And we're going to get into those exemptions in some detail as we go forward. Um, again, in the broader sense, why, why is it important to address buildings? We hear in the media about transportation and other sectors. Why the focus on buildings in Brookline? Well, in Brookline, two-thirds of our emissions come from buildings. So in more urban areas like Boston and Cambridge, that, that percentage is actually even higher. So we need, to, um, we need to address building systems immediately. And the main premise of our bylaw is it makes absolutely no sense to be installing fossil fuel systems in new buildings or significant renovations when we actually know, as Amy has pointed out, that we need to be ripping these systems out. Um, so um, that's the main. Yeah, when I, when I see a new building being constructed as I walk down the street, um, on a daily basis, it, it sort of pains me, actually, mm -hmm. to know that natural gas infrastructure is being put into that building. I know that that is lighting a fire that will literally burn on and off for decades. And um, so um, it's so important that we, that we stop doing that and that buildings are such an important part of the equation when it comes to reducing emissions. Mm -hmm. Well, so... This bill is going to help move Brookline towards the electrification of its building stock, and importantly, even the existing building stock, as you've already explained. Why is it adv advantageous? Why, just again, big overview for people who may not understand this, why is moving towards all electric building infrastructure an, an advantage? We, we just heard a lot of the grid that, that is supplying the electricity to these buildings is, is, is producing electricity with fossil fuels. So can you explain why moving towards an all-electric building stock is... So is as, as Tommy cool? mentioned, uh, today, uh, if you just take a building and you, can, you were to convert it to electric, or if you're considering building you know, two new buildings, an electric or a, or a, a, a gas uh, building, um, today the emissions are lower already from, from the electric building uh, using the heat pumps for space heating. Um, and that advantage gets bigger and bigger over time, and that's because you know, if you think of the three major areas we need to solve, probably electricity generation is one of them, and then electrification of transport and electrification of buildings. Those I think of as three of the major areas. Um, the train has left the station when it comes to the greening of the grid, when it comes to electricity production. And that's through policy, as, as Tommy mentioned, but it's also with an insurance policy of economics because it's um, so economically compelling at this point to to build new renewable electricity generation. And so that train has left the station. And so we know, looking down the road in 10, 20, 30 years, we know that our grid is going to be getting greener and greener and greener. And um, at the same time, we're still going to have the buildings that, that we build today and the buildings that, that already exist. And so um, the electrification, uh, the, the um, greening of the grid is is really, in a sense, while there's many challenges that remain, the easy part. Um, and, and the harder part is, is addressing the actual buildings and, and electrifying them. Mm -hmm. When you say the train has left the station, you, in a way you mean it in a positive sense that I think. Yes. Can you clarify that there's already legislation in place that will, over time, uh, move the grid uh, towards a greener, greener power source. Do you want to talk about the grid any more than, I, I know Tommy did a good job of explaining some things about where the grid's going. Did you want to add to that? 
Right now, the right now the grid is mandated to um, increase in renewables two percent per year through 2029. Um, so I think that's one of the things that Jesse was getting at. Um, we need to electrify with with urgency. Um, we need to probably electrify faster than that, but. Um, we are on track for doing that, and um, we're hopeful that things will get even more aggressive in this space. So it's, we really have a three-pronged um, three agenda that we have to look at. We have to look at um, the greening of the grid and increased um, efficiencies and um, uh, I increased efficiencies um, in our buildings, and then we also need to look at going all electric. Mm -hmm. so to put it really simply, we green the grid, but that's a train that's left the station, and then we electrify everything, and that's that's what this bylaw is focused mm -hmm. on. It seems that it also allows for decentralized sources as well as the grid, like photovoltaics, and to also plug into uh, into these electrified projects. So let's talk a little bit about cost. So did you f d did you find pushback relative to cost implication, whether it's first cost? But also operating costs. Can you talk a little bit about that? What are the effects of the bylaw relative to cost? Yeah. So um, there was. So it turns out that it it is a s it is r very roughly cost neutral and can save money um, to build an all electric building. Um, and it turns out that it can. Um, be be cheaper to operate an electric building depending on the air sealing and insulation. So for um, for equivalent, fully equivalent air sealing and insulation, um, it will it will cost very slightly more to operate an all electric building. But um, if you compare it to the existing buildings in in Brookline, which are incredibly leaky, <laughs> and incredibly poorly insulated, and they're and they're being um, heated with gas. Um, the utility cost of a brand new all electric building will be far lower, mm -hmm. um, and so um, so cost is complicated. Uh, the different projects are different. Um, there's lots of different building types, um, and um, in putting together this bylaw, we did not do an exhaustive comparison of every type of project, um, but we looked in detail at a couple types of projects, and um, it's uh, often often money saving. To, to build an all-electric mm -hmm. building. We also know that the cost of retrofitting building will be far more than the cost of doing it correctly just to begin with. So that's uh, you know, something that we really need to keep in mind, that we can't keep on um, building new buildings that we know will need to be immediately retrofitted for much for much greater cost. Right. So th this, is a, this is actually a really key point. So in our heads, we're, we're, we're tempted, um, and we end up doing the cost comparison of, what an what an electric building would cost us today and the dollars that we actually have to spend now versus a non-electric building. But um, in a sense, um, that's outmoded thinking. It's really not the right comparison. The right comparison is really, um, if we're going to solve this problem, if we're committed to actually solving this problem, um, then that means that building has to eventually be electrified. So the real cost comparison is um, the what Lisa's talking about. How much would it cost to just build it all electric now versus to retrofit that building mm -hmm. later? And that cost comparison overwhelmingly favors the construction of all electric now. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's a tens of thousands of dollars of difference, even on a small, small project. That's really helpful. I also find, as an architect, when you mention um, the envelope, it, it resonates because we're all familiar with the increase, increasingly stringent energy codes and also the popularity, growing popularity, of other building standards like Passive House that are driving the envelopes to be better and better, and both the construction industry and the design industry are getting better at producing those. And that helps us understand that part of the cost picture for uh, operating costs involves this change and improvement in envelopes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's an important point, and that's why we, with this bylaw, that's why we, we um, focused on those two triggers, brand new construction and major renovations, because those are the times when you are enabled um, to um, do that building envelope sealing and to do that insulation. Um, so those are the times when it's really practical to electrify, most mm -hmm. practical, yeah. Great, thank you. So if we're talking about costs, I think it brings up something that many people are concerned about. What role does climate justice 
play in the thinking and the implementation of a bylaw like this? Is this going to benefit underserved communities, or is it, or are its bene benefits more concentrated? Um, and also, what about pr different kinds of programs like affordable housing? How does it affect um, those initiatives when you change from um, fossil fuel to um, electrified heating and, and other sources? So when we were crafting this bylaw, one of the things that we found out um, was that affordable housing is actually leading the way. Um, it's leading the way in the state, and it's leading the way in Brookline. Um, and the reason why it's leading in the way is because it's um, cost effective to build all electric. Um, there are also many incentives and rebates in place. Um, so we, f we anticipated that affordable housing might be um, an issue, and when in fact we found out that in Brookline, two of the major um, uh, affordable housing projects that were underway already were all already switching to all electric. Um, and also by using um, air source heat pumps, they were able to supply their residents with, he um, with air conditioning as well as with heat. That's great. Um, can one of the things that, as I started to learn about this new bylaw, that I found very interesting were the exemptions. Um, could you explain a, a bit about the exemptions, how they work, um, and why, since since they are very broad and allow many projects to actually have a gas hookup, why don't why don't they just take the teeth out of this out of this uh, bylaw? Can you explain a little more about that? Right, so some of the exemptions are for very technical reasons. So it turns out if you have a if you have a central hot water heater for a large building, uh, there's not a great solution for, um, for f there's not a heat pump uh, central hot water heating system that uh, that we were aware of that anyone had is installed anywhere in, in the state of Massachusetts. And so we, we exempted that because we figured if there's not a single example in the state, uh, then it might not be that easy for people to comply mm -hmm. with at the level of a mandate. That might be something that's maybe more amenable to incentives, um, maybe more amenable to um, w you know technology development. Um, uh, in the case of, um, of restaurants, um, some, something like 99% uh, percent or more of restaurants use gas in one way or another. Um, is it possible to electrify restaurants? Yes, actually, like the entire international terminal of, of LAX um, is all electric and has a bunch of restaurants in it, including a pizzeria and uh, like dozens of other restaurants. So, is it possible? Yes. Um, would it would it probably cause a lot of outrage in the restaurant industry? A absolutely. Um, part of the goal here was also to um, build a big tent and maintain a big tent in, in Brookline, um, because this isn't the only uh, step that we need to take to address our, our climate problem. And so if we rile everybody up and pick lots of uh, unnecessary battles, um, we're not going to be able to build that, that big tent. And so this is, although this feels radical to, to many people when they first hear about it, um, it actually is, is very practical. But it would be less practical if we didn't have those uh, those exemptions, and um, you know to to boil down to one that's maybe more of uh, one of the more ambiguous exemptions, one of the more contested exemptions, um, one that we could have probably gone either way on, is that we did exempt residential um, gas cooking. Okay, mm -hmm. now there's no technical reason why residential cooking needs to be exempted. Um, in my own home, I cook with induction. And and I, I replaced my gas uh, cooktop with an induction cooktop, and it's superior in every way for cooking. Um, and so there's no technical reason. There's there's only cultural reasons. And uh, again, we chose in Brookline to build the biggest tent that we could, and and that's probably the best explanation for why we included that particular mm -hmm. kind of borderline exemption. I also had the misunderstanding that. Um, the exemptions uh, uh, essentially allowed hookups, and I was viewing it when I first learned about it as a very black and white condition. Either you're hooked up to gas and you're going to use it, or you're not. But in fact, that's not really the case. Is that correct? Could you explain why that's really not, not an accurate <laughs> understanding of how the exemptions work? Right. So first of all, this, this bylaw only regulates fuel piping behind the gas meter on the customer side of the gas meter. So this bylaw actually does not, although it's often referred to as a ban on hookups, it's not a ban on hookups. Uh, 
um, it's, it, it regulates fuel piping on the customer side of the meter. And you're right, because there's exemptions for things like uh, backup generators, uh, which are still going to be needed and, and are, are still going to need to run on gas to be reliable and to be able to operate over long periods of time. Batteries are still quite expensive for that kind of application. And so, um, yes, you can have a fuel pipe for that, but you can't have one for the space heating. <laughs> and that's police, just like any part of a building project that's been permitted would be police. Exactly. It would be... It would be can also Part add the too that we realized that we weren't going to be able to come up with an exemption for every single possible case that was going to come before the um, building inspector in Brookline. So we also set up a waiver process so that when things, one-off cases do come up in terms of affordability or practicality, then there's a very simple waiver process where people can um, present their case to a board, um, a sustainability review board, and they can get an exemption for their project. And so part of the idea here is to change the, the default choice, uh, much like the sort of the 401k. If, if the default is that you're opted in, more people end up saving for retirement. Sort of like that here in a sense. So, so in a couple ways, so this exemption for residential cooking, well, what you're going to end up uh, having is a choice when you build a brand new building. Is, are y is it worth it for you for a small project to um, put in all of the fuel piping and do the actual gas hookup just to have a, s a gas stove in the kitchen. So now, you're, now you've made it so that there's, there's a, you've just made it harder. You've just increased mm -hmm. the barriers, you've increased the cost. Um, and the same thing with the uh, waiver process where the presumption is it's gonna be all electric and you gotta make the case for why it shouldn't be. So today we have the opposite policy um, you know, prior, to, Im prior mm -hmm. to this Warren article. Today the presumption is probably going to be gas and you got to go out of your way um, and be an environmentalist to make an all-electric mm -hmm. building. <laughs> so we wanted to flip that that logic. And I know that you sought, um, as you say, a big tent, people to advise you, contractors, homeowners, builders, um, to, to arrive at these um, solutions that would make it a, a bylaw that could be passed. What was the technical issue that you found most difficult to explain to the public? What Again, if we're trying to give our audience an overview of this, what, what, was, what were the technical issues that came up most often, and how did you address those? So there's a, sh there's a short list of things that come up again and again and again, and one is that people, don't un people did not understand that it reduces overall emissions to switch a building to electric today. So people thought that you're just moving the source of the emissions from the building to the power plant, and that's just simply not correct. Um, and actually, another widespread misconception, even though thousands of heat pumps have been installed in Massachusetts, another widespread misconception, and this is partly due to the rapid advance in technology of heat pumps, they've gotten really good, um, but the misconception is that they don't work in the cold. And of course, mm -hmm. you know, a great counterexample to that is, is your freezer. You know, your freezer takes heat from inside a, a, a you know, negative 20 degree space and moves that heat out into a room temperature space. Um, but nonetheless, that was, that was a major misconception. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you, Lisa, did you want to fill in about the heat um, pump? I think everybody, uh, what was interesting too about the process is that um, people came at this in terms of their own concerns. So people wanted to know um, generally how, how, the ga how this um, bylaw was going to affect their life. So people wanted to know, can I replace my um, boiler in the middle of the night if it if it stops, you know, is that is that going to be something I have to worry about? Um, and so, yeah, that's basically it. And they can, and replace, they can. <laughs> replace their and boiler. They can. <laughs> All right. Um, let's shift a little. So that, I hope, gives a, a bit of an overview of what this is and why it's a big deal. Let's shift a little bit to the process because you've just succeeded. You had a 211 to 3 vote, which sounds overwhelming, makes it almost sound like maybe it was easy, which we know it wasn't. Can you talk about the keys to success? Many people in the room, I think, uh, are involved in efforts to bring similar legislation to their own towns and cities. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you think the most important aspects of the successful process in Brookline were? Um, well, I'd say the most important aspect was that we, um, we had a lot of open public meetings, um, and we just listened to people's concerns, and then we, 
um, let them talk about their concerns, we let them ask questions, and then we answer their questions very patiently with facts. And I think this listening process was, was really one of the keys to our success. Yeah, I think that um, in order to convince people to support Warren Article 21, um, they had this short list of concerns. How would it affect them? Uh, is it really practical? Is it really going to work? And uh, would it uh, cost a lot of money and um, slow down development in the town? So all these kinds of concerns. And addressing these concerns with individual people often required um, hours of conversation with them and bringing data to them and um, coming back again and again to them, both uh, through committee processes and one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Um, you know how how long of a process was that? So this was about. So this is a new um, sort of strategy, a new legal strategy for a, for a municipality in Massachusetts to take. So there were a few months of legal research at the beginning, and then there were a few months of really intense uh, political work, uh, which is part of the normal process in Brookline for passing any legislation, any warrant article. Um, there are lots and lots of committee meetings. Um, and so the committee meeting started in August, and they went through no, uh, right up to town meeting in November. Mm -hmm. I we're starting to understand that there's th the the large group of people who helped with this was a was a key part of the success. We know technically there's 11, I believe, co-petitioners, but um, how many people really were involved in this effort, and what were what were their um, strengths? How did they? What so was their role? There were 11 co-petitioners, two of whom will be. Um, joining us in a few minutes, um, and there were uh, so that there was a core group, I'd say, a core handful of people who were working on this almost full time, and then there were a broader group that um, helped us communicate with everybody in town meeting, <coughs> excuse me, and in the community, um, and helped us with sort of town wide communication, and then there was an even broader group of experts that we. Um, that we relied upon in order to come to meetings to help us to help us do research, and that was well over a hundred people of, mm -hmm. of people what, that we contacted. What type of experts were key to? Um, well, actually, the, thanks for giving the lead in to thanking Ellen Watts because um, she uh, helped put this event together. Um, she's a fabulous architect. She wasn't able to be here today because she just had a, a small operation on her foot yesterday, but. Um, but people like Ellen um, and some of the people who you're going to be hearing from um, later in the program um, would show up to our meetings and would help explain um, the technicalities of building all electric. That was really important. Um, and then we also relied on experts to um, help craft our wired article in terms of finding out more about, um, for example, what's possible in restaurant cooking and other, other in helping our, us craft our exemptions. Mm -hmm. Now that the Warren article has been passed, this new bylaw has been passed, um, what comes next? What, what is the next um, step that's going to occur in Brookline? And what's the next step for this, this team that you've built? <laughs> well, the, the next step, um, this, this bylaw hasn't taken effect yet. And um, before it can take effect, uh, just like any uh, bylaw passed by uh, a town, in the Commonwealth, it will be reviewed um, by the Municipal Law Unit of the Attorney General's Office. So that's the next step for the bylaw. Um, and um, in terms of uh, you know the next step for Brookline, I think there's a long list <laughs> <laughs> of tasks in front of us. Uh, and of course, uh, not all of these can really be uh, addressed at the town or city level. So, so many of these problems um, will need to be addressed uh, at the state level. Um, and one of those uh, problems is the electrification of existing buildings that aren't otherwise undergoing um, major renovations, uh, as, Amy, as Amy brought up. Um, that, that, is a, that is a much harder problem um, and one that we will st still nonetheless have to tackle. Mm -hmm. And another next step is what we're doing here today, which is that we're trying to do a lot of outreach to other towns and cities, and we're hoping that they will follow in our footsteps. Um, and um, thank you, Michael, for mentioning that we'd like people here, the experts here, to be able to reach out to, there are a lot of people from towns and cities who are either um, have already moved their own legislation or in the process of thinking about it. So 
Um, we really want to make this into a movement, and we really want people to follow in our footsteps. We really have, we have to decarbonize now, and we have no time to wait. Yeah, Lisa, Lisa uh, has been um, leading the Brookline part of the effort along with Cora Weisbord, um, and has been working closely with uh, Carol Oldham at MCAN and um, building uh, a gas ban um, listserv and um, creating uh, a network of people so that we are not all working alone in our separate communities. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we just got time for one more quick question before we bring some more of the co-petitioners up and then uh, open it up to the audience. And I would say maybe what would be great to ask you guys for a last question is, what did you learn from the process that you would want to communicate to other communities that are engaged in similar efforts uh, to put put forward and pass similar legislation, and particularly maybe Boston. Can, can Boston do this? What, what should Boston know about um, getting something like this passed? Should they do this? Um, I'm, not, I'm not really familiar with, the, uh, with Boston in particular, but I think every town and city can do this. And I think the lesson you can learn from Brookline is that when we started this, um, none of us were experts. We're still not experts. And um, we worked together as a team. Um, we marshaled our resources. Um, and we are now sharing all our resources online and also actively mentoring other towns and cities. So my message is that everyone can do this and everyone should do it as soon as possible. Yeah, my, my message would be that you know, we need to choose, w in, in, f in solving climate at this moment, we need to choose actions that are at sort of uh, the intersection of three circles that form a, a Venn diagram. One is um, practicality. Is it actually doable? And this, this one actually is. This is something that's practical. Um, and the other one is, does it have a big impact? This actually does have a significant impact. Not as much as solving the whole building problem, but it's, it's where we need to start. So it does have impact, and it's, it is a significant impact. And the final piece is political, um, po make being possible politically. And so th this um, step is actually right at that, that sweet spot, that intersection of politically possible, actually practical and, and economically practical to do, um, and high impact. Um, now, the other thing I would just say is that we often, as climate activists, go in and we want to talk about polar bears and how terrible the problem is, and we, want, and we want to convince people by sharing with them the dire nature of the problem. And I have to say that that wasn't effective in Brookline, and that's not how we ended up doing this. Um, in Brookline, at least, we, we have a community of people who actually want to solve the problem and are very interested in it. They, they just don't know what the steps are that need to be taken. And um, they had a lot of questions. Is this really the right series of steps to take? And so the conversation that was compelling and convincing that actually worked was the conversation about um, why these are the steps that actually make sense and why these steps are practical. Um, and that's not necessarily natural for climate activists who often want to come in and talk about polar bears and who often um, come in with um, proposals that are not necessarily um, practical right at this exact moment. Mm -hmm. It sounds like not so much talking at all, but listening was a crucial part of getting to something that could really be passed as a piece of legislation. It was. I, I just want to add one point, though. I, I will say that we, we do need to talk about our climate goals when we frame this question. And um, Brookline has a goal of zero emissions by 2050. But um, the IPCC came out with a report, which I think everybody in the room is familiar with, that we need to get to approximately 50% of our carbon emissions by 2030. So when you frame the problem in that way, you realize that we don't have any time to wait and we need to get going immediately. So I think that particular framing of the issue, apart from what Jesse was saying, I think that was very helpful because then people realize we, we have a goal and we can't meet it unless we start immediately. That's great, thank you very much. So we're gonna change the format just a little bit and we're gonna invite uh, two of the other co-petitioners to join us. Um, Lisa, maybe you could uh, introduce them a little and I'm just gonna ask a quick kickoff question to them. Why don't you come on up to the front? Um, I'd like to introduce two of my fellow co-petitioners, um, Kathleen. Um, 
Scanlon and Diane Sokol, who are both um, architects and who are both members of Mothers at Front, as I as am I, and both were incredibly active um, uh, in this in this um, effort. So thanks so much for being here. Okay, by way Thank of you. introduction, I'm going to ask really quick questions, and then we're going to open it up to to the audience. Um, so, um, Diane, as, as an architect and co-petitioner and an active member of uh, Brookline Mothers Out Front, uh, I understand that you did a lot of work um, to figure out the proposed uh, renovation threshold, so the defining the thresholds at which the bylaw would kick in. Can you give us a little background and understanding on that? Sure, thanks. Um, I think the team felt that it was very important to include renovations. Brookline has older housing stock, um, one of our teammates found census data that showed that 50% of Brookline housing units, 24,000 housing units, built before 1940, and only less than 4% built after 20, 2000, which is already 20 years old. So we have this old building stock. We really needed to capture renovations, and what we're seeing around town is these gut rehabs, often at change of ownership, buildings stripped down to the um, exterior framing, and that's really a similar scope of work to new construction where you have the walls open and you can really do the insulation, you can do the air sealing and putting in new systems. So how could we define what in terms um, that architects could understand, that homeowners could understand, that the building department could understand? How could we define gut rehab? And um, as the self-declared code geek on the team. You know, I was looking through the building code and, and the, the commercial building code somewhat has this definition of level three alteration, um, which would really capture what we were looking at for the gut rehabs. But that wasn't in the, in the residential building code. So our challenge was really how can we define this so it's applicable to residential projects and to commercial projects. And we originally just started the, the bylaw went through many uh, iterations, and originally it was very simple. We said, you know, 50% of renovations for all projects, and people had a hard time understanding that for residential buildings. You know, what's this going to mean when I want to renovate my condo? What's it going to mean for my mother's triple decker? And so we had to put together a lot of sort of diagrams of how a 50% threshold you know, what kind of renovation work in a building would meet that threshold and what wouldn't. And eventually, people were still a little nervous about, you know, renovating two units out of three in a triple decker. That's going to be more than 50%. And so we did compromise to raise that residential threshold to 75%. But it was a, lo it was a long process of listening, listening to the building department, listening to architects, to really be able to craft something that everyone could understand. Great, thank you. Kathleen, you're also an architect and a town meeting member, and you are a co-petitioner. You're uh, also coordinator for Brookline Mothers Out Front. What was your most important takeaway from the experience of, of getting this bylaw passed? Well, there are a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I would say, you know, in my work with Brookline and uh, Mothers Out Front, um, I, you know, come from an activist uh, mindset, and I think Jesse touched on this a bit. When we would go to a hearing, for instance, um, and there were over 40, uh, we had to really prepare for their particular concerns. But it wasn't about convincing them about the urgency. It was really uh, drilling down into the practicalities. So here was a very busy board, for instance, who only had an hour to understand this very large problem. And it was convincing them that this was the low-hanging fruit with the building stock and that the technology was already there and it wouldn't present a learning curve for the town or builders or, um, or other people with concerned financial interests. So we had to really demonstrate that this was a proven you know, technology and track record of building that was mm -hmm. available through, you know, profiling projects for them. So uh, I just wanted to, we, we have an additional panelist that we're, we're adding here, Scott Ananian. Welcome. Also, <laughs> also a town meeting member uh, from Brookline and a, an unofficial co-petitioner. I think we accidentally didn't get his name on there. But, <laughs> but uh, Scott, in particular, 
uh, has not only done a lot of work uh, in Brookline, but has also um, been uh, uh, attending and, and speaking with um, uh, a very important committee, um, the, the BBRS, the Board of Building Regulations and Standards, uh, which um, promulgates uh, the building code in, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And so, Scott, would you like to, to speak to um, you know the the role of the BBRS and 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 how Warren Article 21 fits into a larger landscape in the Commonwealth uh, about how we approach electrification of buildings. Sure. I'll, oh boy, that's very loud. Um, <laughs> I don't have to hold it quite as close. Um, so the the context is I started um, getting involved at the building code level for a, a slightly different thing, which is um, electric vehicle support and sort of EV ready charging standards and whatnot. So a couple of years before, starting in, in 2016 or so, um, I had started looking into the town zoning and bylaws and uh, the interaction of the BBRS to see what would be possible um, in, in that regard. Um, and I ran into uh, a lot of the issues which came up with the fossil free um, Warren Article 21 uh, a couple of years later, um, which is uh, <laughs> a lot of finger pointing. So the, um, the state build of Board of Building Regulations and Standards obviously wants to promulgate a uniform building code across the state because that makes it easier for everyone to know what they can and cannot build. Um, and that's somewhat at odds with um, towns' desires to be more forward-looking in certain areas of the, of the building code. Um, and so if you ask the state building code um, folks, uh, you know, I, I want to do this, I want to require a certain number of EV spaces, or I want to require buildings be fossil fuel free, they usually point the finger back at zoning and say, um, you know, this isn't something for the building code, this is a matter, a pro a matter that is for town zoning. Um, but of course, when you talk to the town zoning folks, they'll point the finger the other way and say, oh, but by state law, we can't um, you know, meddle in things which are building code. Um, this has to come from the building code. Um, and so there's a, a, a lot of uh, finger pointing back and forth. And uh, I, I'm sure Jesse has talked a little bit about the strategy that we used for Warren Article 21 um, to sort of bypass that cycle. Um, but uh, there, is a, there is a loophole in state law um, in uh, chapter 143, section 98, which, which sort of allows towns to have um, very specific loopholes to the building code for um, matters which are sufficiently important. Um, but in the 25 years that loophole has existed, no one has used it um, at all. Or no one has used it si since the 70s, basically. Um, but that might be something that in the future could be looked into um, as a way to sort of push back. Um, uh, the the state board of uh, building regulations and standards is a little bit dysfunctional right now. They um, they still haven't uh, formally uh, promulgated the 2018 uh, energy code um, amendments, which they're by law required to do within a year, um, and uh, they're sort of in an administrative logjam. Um, so unfortunately, th my bottom line is, is just that you can't really expect very much from them right now. Um, but it, it is uh, uh, hopeful that we can uh, use those mechanisms in the future. Great. Thank you. I think we're going to go ahead and open it up so we can follow up on that. That's a key concept, though, that the bylaws can't conflict and tread on the, the purview of the building codes, which is very important. So uh, without further delay, we'd like to hear from the audience. So thank you all very much. I I'm working in Somerville, and I'm sure you can appreciate that your work is inspiring a lot of us. So the question I have is about labor. Uh, you may know, but a lot of the other towns that are considering this have started getting pushed back. Some discussion of a just transition for, I think that was referring to architects, but I, I'm curious kind of how Brookline addresses. The question was about how Brookline addressed labor concerns. The, the change in technology affects the, the building trades as well. Right. Sure, uh, right. So um, to, to be perfectly honest, in the, in the political process in Brookline, um, we, uh, the, the constituencies that we were convincing and the, and the conversations we had didn't focus too much on, um, on laborers. Um, st st that, that's a concern that's actually come up since the bylaw was passed, and so now is uh, firmly in, in the conversation. Um, I think um, you know it's it's definitely 
con it would be concerning to me if I if I were a gas worker, um, to the the concept that um, that we would no longer be um, installing new gas piping in homes. Um, it you know a lot of this is done by plumbers who who actually have um, you know other types of pipes that they're they're installing. Um, this is also a very modest proposition. We're talking about about half a percent of the building stock in Brookline that's that's turned over um, every year. But but stepping back, I think I think we have to think about the strategy. And if if we're committed to solving the problem of climate change, there will be certain kinds of jobs that are going to be eliminated, and there will be lots and lots of other jobs that that will be created um, in terms of renewable energy, in terms of you know heat pump installation. And so uh, this is a really challenging issue. Um, it's an issue that uh, we did not fully flesh out in Brookline um, as part of our process and one that I think is really important to, to grapple with now. But I think the main thing is that um, we, need to, um, uh, we need to make this transition and then we need to do it in the most just possible way. So we should be looking out for uh, the people with the expertise and the skills that are maybe no longer be uh, needed as frequently. Um, but we should also be aware that this transition is going to be gradual. And so in some sense, the, the impact on uh, gas workers may be uh, actually sort of similar to the level of, of retirement um, from, from that kind of work. And so it's, it's probably not a really dramatic change, at least, at least yet. Um, I just wanted you. to add something to that, which was that uh, Mothers Out Front is um, working with labor to understand their concerns. And I think they are a very organized vocal group. And Brookline got a lot of media coverage after the ban was passed. So it might not have been on their radar, but they are quickly have organized. And um, you know, Mothers Out Front understands the importance of cultivating them along from their past work um, with unions on gas leaks and getting those repaired. So it's a very complicated issue. Um, and I think uh, we have, you know, they're going to be working to figure out the strategies that can bring them along so efforts like these aren't undermined. Thank you. Two questions um, related to the building code issue is, br sorry? Oh, Bill Beam, architect. Um, building code issue. Is Brookline looking to implement this via the building code or via the zoning code? And the second part of that question is, with the building code work you're doing, would there be any way to implement this via a stretch code like provision where munici municipalities can adopt a greater version of the code? The question is, is, was this implemented under zoning or under the building code? And actually the answer is, is neither. So th this, this is a general bylaw um, that is not a zoning bylaw and it is not um, a, a building code uh, regulation. Um, this was a bylaw that was inspired by an action taken by Berkeley, California, and it was very recent. It was this summer um, that Berkeley passed their own uh, gas ban, and they were followed pretty rapidly by about 20 other California municipalities. Um, and so uh, Berkeley actually worked out uh, a lot of the key legal issues, um, at least in the state of California. Of course, we have different different laws here in Massachusetts, but uh, they worked out some really key aspects of the, the strategy for municipalities. And one of them was, you know, you municipalities can't uh, regulate utilities. And so that's why this bylaw affects um, piping inside buildings. And then a second one is that um, uh, in, in many states, uh, municipalities have limited control over, over building standards. And so that's why this bylaw actually doesn't attempt to implement standards, it doesn't have requirements about how piping be installed or, um, so it, it, it does not purport to regulate the materials or methods of construction. It simply um, prohibits installation of fuel piping. And in that sense, um, pr that's why it's a general bylaw. Uh, however, I think a lot of these um, same solutions could be certainly implemented through the building code and maybe Scott could address that, that part of the question. Yeah, so very very briefly, there's basically three ways that you can do this through the, the building code process. Um, the first is the, the loophole in MGL uh, 143, section 98. Um, but again, no one's tried that 
recently, um, uh, but I, I think it would be very interesting to try, and that's actually um, the first mechanism that I had tried for um, EV charging in, in Brookline back in 2016. Um, the second is at the um, state legislature level, and our, our, uh, my representative, <laughs> Vitolo, is here, um, and the, uh, the Massachusetts, uh, the energy bill that just recently passed in the Senate, I don't know how it's doing in the House or if it passed there, um, uh, intervened in a pretty direct way in the Board of Building Regulations and Standards. It set uh, requirements on membership to include uh, more energy conscious folks in it um, and uh, mandated that they begin work on a next generation stretch code. So if you recall, the stretch code in Massachusetts was originally more or less exactly this idea, but over time, the base code and the stretch code have merged. So what was stretch code is now more or less the, the base code. Um, and there are very, very minor differences between them. So the idea is, uh, perhaps it's time for another a, a, a next generation stretch code that that towns can opt into um, that would set uh, fossil fuel requirements or, or net zero requirements and exactly what that means still has to be fleshed out um, the, the definition of net zero is is, uh, is somewhat fluid um, and then the third way is um, advocating at the national standards level um, and uh, there's a lot of work uh, on green issues in general at, with the idea that the, those will eventually trickle down into uh, Massachusetts um, uh, energy code. By law we're required to represent to, to adopt the national energy code within a year but as I said we still haven't adopted the 2018 national code so um, yeah. Great. There are 350 towns in Massachusetts. Is there any effort to form some kind of association or organization to coordinate all of those efforts. A clue might be the 2,000 colleges and universities in the United States, right? Who all formed that Association for American Presidents of American Colleges and Universities and coordinated climate action plans. That's a great idea and um, we're in the very early stages of, of organizing uh, across municipalities. This event is, is part of that. Uh, strategy. Of course, there's, there's are, there are also already um, organizations that link together municipalities. I think the, the Ma Massachusetts Municipal Association, MMA, I think it's called. Um, so there are organizations that we um, need to do more work to, to tap into uh, in order to do this. I also want to point out, though, that um, the, th the, th the 350 uh, towns uh, across the, the state um, have not all the towns have the same appetite for adopting um, this kind of policy. And um, I think um, the politics is really important here. And the appetite for adopting these kinds of policies is greatest at the local level. And it's greatest in a subset of communities like Brookline that are really ready to take action. And so um, we don't expect every municipality in the state to immediately um, uh, be interested in adopting this kind of bylaw, but we do think it's important that um, within within our federal system that we take climate action at the level where we have the strongest political support. And that's why it's not a coincidence that this movement started in Berkeley, California and is spreading throughout municipalities before it has been adopted by any state. Um, and then I would expect it would be adopted at, at the state level b probably before the federal level as well. Um, so I realize I've diverged somewhat from your question, but I'm, I just I'm, so I want to step back and embrace the idea. It's a great one, and we're in the very early stages of of doing exactly that. Um, I can also add that our team, our Brookline team, is probably in touch with at least 20 towns and cities now that are um, actively trying to either bring this legislation forward or thinking of it. So it is um, this movement is gaining momentum, and hopefully, it will continue to do so. Um, I was just curious if you've looked at all at the added electricity demand on the utility and that will we will it require new peaking facilities to be built in order to accommodate that and should we be focusing as well on energy management systems to manage the load that's coming on? That's my first question. Then the second question, I'm just curious as well, if the grid goes down for several days, what is the plan to ensure heating in the homes? Just so having been in the room with uh, DOER representatives at the building code level, I, I can say it's certainly in the state's planning process um, for reliability and resiliency of the grid and load shifting. Um, and they'd like to, in the early discussions about a net zero energy code, they'd certainly like to incorporate um, load shifting into to more buildings to sort of manage the uh, the added electricity demands and, and, and the fact that 
as buildings become electric, our, the pattern of our electricity usage throughout the day changes um, slightly. Um, and so that's, and they're definitely aware of the fact that a, an all electric future requires a grid which is much more resilient than the one we have now. So it's, it's in the state planning process um, for sure. I, I don't know if anyone wants to take the local part of that. Sure, so uh, what a lot of people don't realize is if the if power goes out, um, most uh, boilers will actually stop functioning because they have electric ignition. And so actually um, people, are, this was something that came up in our conversations, people have the, the misimpression that their heating is not dependent on the electrical grid now, but in fact it is for, for small buildings that don't have backup systems, um, most including most homes. Um, so yeah, I mean, right now a lot of the, the peak electrical demand is in the summer, and that's due to air conditioning. And what heat pumps are is air conditioners that can also operate in reverse. And so what we will start to see, um, not, not in the beginning, you know, not due to the Brookline policy, um, not even due to, you know, if the Brookline policy were adopted statewide, um, it's still going to affect uh, roughly half a percent of buildings per year. And so um, the impact on the grid uh, will be very, very gradual. But eventually, uh, we can expect to start to see more uh, winter peaking of electrical consumption due to those those heat pumps, and um, as Scott was mentioning, you know, a, g a great solution to that type of winter peaking is is installation of more um, wind power um, and um, more storage on the grid. So um, over time, this will become more and more important. My question is based around understanding what was evaluated. I'm seeing a lot of projects using the VRF. Um, understanding the refrigerant impact of an increased amount of use of refrigerant and what that is, understanding the gas, taking the gas out of the picture, but now that we have an increased look at how we're designing using refrigerant, how that was addressed and considered in the process. Yeah, so my understanding, so, uh, so VRF, variable flow refrigerant, uh, is a type of heat pump uh, solution um, used mostly in larger, larger buildings. And uh, there's a couple issues around that. Um, one is around safety, that um, if you do have a leak in a VRF system, you do have to be really careful because if, that, if a lot of that coolant comes out in one room, it can actually uh, cause a suffocation risk. So there's uh, really important building standards that actually need more attention um, in terms of um, VRF and safety. Uh, but I think your question was more around the, uh, uh, the emissions associated with the coolants. And um, in terms of those emissions, um, uh, we did look at that. And the analysis that I'm recalling, it's been a little while, is that roughly speaking, if you had a catastrophic loss of coolant um, and you lost all of the coolant in a building, you know, typically you might lose a few percent or, or so um, in, in typical losses. But if you did have a catastrophic or 100% or loss, you would negate something like seven months of the, of the emissions gain that you had benefited from in, in electrifying. Um, so essentially... Um, the electrification is still really important, still, still really beneficial, even with the, um, the, l the small amount of leaking that is probably inevitable with the installation of these systems. The, the main problem is existing buildings. And going forward is the strategy of the group to provide uh, financial incentives from the public sector to uh, private owners to uh, comply uh, with uh, certain standards or is it uh, to just provide uh, regulations that uh, prohibit owners from uh, not doing what you want? And so when you, when you think about mandates versus incentives, this is a conversation that came up quite a bit in Brookline. Um, if you're going to mandate something, it better not be too difficult to do and it better not be too costly to do. If something is really expensive to do and you mandate it, um, you're going to run into trouble. And so um, that is, again, why we started with new construction and, and major renovation. Now, you're right. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cost more to retrofit existing buildings that aren't otherwise uh, being renovated. And um, probably, you know, that, that um, at least for now, that uh, rests firmly in the policy domain of, of incentives rather than, than mandates. Eventually, uh, we may need mandates there, too, but um, it doesn't seem like something that's right around the corner. What's the experience been? Uh, I know it's only been in effect for a short while, but you must be beginning to get some experience with developers saying, okay, here's, uh, I'm going to go with heat pumps. Um, I'm okay with it. Or 
you know, is there a, a big hiccup with everybody running around trying to figure out how to use heat pump technology or something like that? What's it? What's the uh, big impact been? So right. Far? So just to clarify, um, this has not taken effect yet. It's passed, but it has not taken effect. And in order to ev to take effect, it will have to be approved by the attorney general. So we're a few steps away from it taking effect. Nonetheless, actually, we've heard from some local projects just in response to the political discussion um, that they are planning to comply with the bylaw. Um, w you know whether or not uh, it, it, it goes into effect. And I think at the residential level, um, I'm a, I work ma mainly in the residential level in architecture, and I'd say at the residential level, there's a lot of interest. Um, people are just um, beginning to understand that this is really the only way to build. And so um, people, I found that clients embrace it, and also um, contractors have been embracing this. Yeah, and certainly for, for town projects with a sort of long lead time, um, the, 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 the idea that this is going to take into effect someplace means that anyone with moderate long-term planning is planning for um, it, uh, a net zero building, and that hasn't been an issue so far in any of those discussions. Um, I'll say briefly before I give up the mic that the, um, the Mass Climate Action Network has been, been doing great uh, advocacy work on behalf of the net zero um, stretch code. Um, and if you are interested at all in, in furthering the, the uh, building committee work and also trying to overcome some of the dysfunction in the, in the current BBRS, that would be a great effort to support. I just wanted to add that in preparation for all of those many hearings we did have, we had to tailor each of those presentations and that required a lot of research. So one of the beauties of the three us three women being architects, we had a whole network to reach out to, to get on the ground experiences, um, take those questions that we knew in, in advance, get the answer so we had it on hand for the hearing, and sometimes bringing those experts in for the hearings. So we were able to meet with a lot of developers and builders who were already doing that kind of work and prove that this was not a new technology that required that learning curve. It really was achievable. Okay, yeah, that's it. I, I yeah. think we're out of time. And Thank that was you. a great uh, segue into our next section that will be, we have a 15 minute break now. Um, and bathroom code here, more food, coffee. Please take the opportunity to also ask the panelists questions during this time, network with each other. Um, Michael, any other? Yes, the panelists have asked me to make sure that everyone knows they can come up and ask them questions. Also, if you're an expert who's willing to share your expertise, who's involved in this process, Please grab a cup of coffee and then maybe come back up here to the front if you will make yourself available to some of the folks in the audience who might want to ask you questions.